Hello. Wondering what to buy the games buff in your life for Christmas? Worry no more, as Bad Influence gives you the complete lowdown on the Christmas goodies, including our special guide to buying from abroad. And our main review this week is Mickey and Donald's World of Illusion on the Mega Drive. And now I'll be lurking around the only museum in the world devoted to computers. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Actually, before we go any further, can anybody over the age of about 19 just leave the room for a second, please? They gone? Right, the rest of you, come here. The next bit is not really for you, the games experts. It's what you might call a service to Santa. Get my drift? Just thought I'd let you know. OK, so sorry about the next bit. Oh, here you go. <clears throat> right, they can come back in again now. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Bad Influence is proud to present its Idiot's Guide to Christmas Computers. I thank you. The first decision you have to make is whether to buy a computer or a console. Even expensive consoles like this one, the Neo Geo, cost less than most computers. They're very easy to use because the games come on cartridges, which plug in and run straight away. But they are only designed to play games. Computers have keyboards and cost more, around £400 for the most popular ones. They require some technical skills to load the software, normally from floppy disks like these. But they can be used for lots of things as well as games. Painting systems, like this one word processing to make music and so on and so forth so if you just want to play games go for a console if you think you might want to do other things as well pay the extra money and get a computer the consoles you'll see in the high street are made by two main companies sega whose star is sonic the hedgehog with attitude and nintendo famous for mario the brooklyn plumber the older consoles are called the sega master system and the nes which stands for nintendo entertainment system they're what's known as 8-bit consoles and they're old technology. We don't recommend buying them new. You can get 8-bit machines complete with a load of games, cheaply second-hand, as people sell them when they buy more expensive equipment. The latest consoles are called 16-bit. They are the Sega Mega Drive and the Super NES. They play faster games, have much better graphics and sound, and lots of games are being produced for them. But they're more expensive to buy, from about £130 upwards, and the games will cost you a lot more too. Of course, you might want a handheld. There are four main ones and they all come with a game. The cheapest is the Supervision, which has a monochrome screen and costs around £39.95. It also has the cheapest games at around £15 each. Next is the most popular, the Game Boy, which is around £70. Also monochrome, but with loads of great games, all at about £25 each. There are also two colour handhelds. Games for both cost about £30. First, the Game Gear, which costs £100, but you can also turn it into a telly for an extra £60 by buying this TV tuner. Then there's this one, the Lynx, which also costs £100 and is technically probably the best, although there aren't so many games for it. Whichever system or handheld you buy, we recommend one bundled with a game because it'll always be cheaper than buying the game separately, but do make sure they're actually games you want to play. And one final word of warning. Don't buy anything advertised cheaply as discontinued or old stock. You might get a hardware bargain, but you may well never find any games to play on an out-of-date system. But now back to up-to-date systems, and our main review this week is Mickey and Donald's World of Illusion on the Mega Drive. In this story, the Disney duo are amateur conjurers who've been sucked into a magic box and transported to a weird and wonderful world where nothing is quite what it seems. Mm -hmm. Here's, Here's James. James. This is my kind of game. You really have to think to get through it, but it's great fun. There's something magical about the graphics that makes it look fantastic. You get to different levels by going through the strangest of places. That fishbowl took me into a giant room with amazing things to explore. In the single player mode, you get to be either Mickey or Donald. If I was playing Donald at the moment, I would be having a very different adventure. This is the two player mode. Mickey and Donald need to help each other to progress. It's all about solving puzzles by teamwork. I'd really like this game. It looks excellent and it's very playable. It's a must for Christmas. I love this game, it's beautiful. It makes you smile, it's just like a cartoon. This is a massive game with huge levels. They've really thought about this game. There's some lovely touches. I'd definitely buy this one. And so the final scores for Mickey and Donald World of Illusion. Everybody loved it. The boys gave it five out of five and the girls gave it five out of five. Christmas bells, ding dong, ding dong. Christmas bells are in my song. <laughs> ah, hello, slimy furtlers. I'm just cleaning up the shed a bit, getting ready for Christmas. 
<laughs> anyway, here's a cheat for Tetris on the Game Boy. Now, if you're absolutely brilliant like me and you fancy a bit of a challenge, try this. On the title screen, press start and down together. Then, you'll get a little heart next to your level number and the whole game speeds up. Now, if it's going too quickly for you pathetic types, simply pause the game by pressing start. Now, normally, when you press start, you don't see which block is coming next. But if you now press select, then your next block will be revealed. So, you can have a little think. Right, I think I'll carry on with my cleaning now. <laughs> Maybe I'll just have a little tidy instead. <laughs> that there. there. Just finished level 452. These handheld games are only possible because of the way computers and computer chips have gotten smaller and smaller over the last few years. But here in Boston, they've just spent over a million dollars to build the biggest computer in the world. Monster Machine has a screen two stories tall and has keys 30 centimeters across and boasts the biggest microchip in the world. And you can even see the electricity moving around inside. And it actually works. Using this giant tracker ball, you can get the computer to tell you the shortest route between any two cities. Okay, press the button. Your starting city is Boston. Roll the ball, then click on the button to choose your destination. Your destination is Los Angeles. Searching for the shortest route, please wait. Go through New York, Cincinnati, Oklahoma City, Phoenix, and into Los Angeles. The Mega Machine is the star exhibit at the Computer Museum in Boston. It's the only museum in the world that's dedicated to computers, and it covers everything from roams to robots, from graphics to games. Oh, um, I'm not really playing. It's composed and played by the machine. Yeah, cool music, yeah. And now for some more amazing computer. Bad influence, boy. <laughs> Bad influence, boy. This is the oldest computer in the museum, the Whirlwind. It was built 47 years ago in 1945. It was used by the Army to work out where shells would land. This is the problem that the Army wanted to solve, how this gun could hit this target. Let's position the gun to 45 degrees, and how many bags of gunpowder? Two. Let's see. Is it going to go? Well, uh, mm, I don't think so. Too short. Instead of chips, the whirlwind used valves. And they were so unreliable that it wouldn't work for more than a few minutes without breaking down. Lots of engineers would be running around all the time trying to find out which valves had broken and fix them quickly before the enemy tanks could move. One of the main uses of computers today is to produce and manipulate images. It's a computer that does this to me. <laughs> and this. And this. Whoa! But the very first picture to be manipulated inside a computer was this baby, who was probably surprised to be turned into a line drawing by the machine. This teapot is very famous. Why? Because a researcher called Martin Newell was looking for a simple curve-shaped object to program into his computer. He had this teapot on his desk, so he carefully photographed and measured it. Then he put all the coordinates into his computer. Other researchers simply borrowed Newell's data, and a flood of computerized teapots was unleashed on the world. In the early days of computers and robots, a lot of people wondered whether machines would take over the world. This part of the museum is devoted to machines that can think for themselves. Of course, the very early robots were pretty scary. Not because they were mega intelligent, but because they might bump into you. The latest artificial intelligence machines are a bit more useful. In fact, these kinds of machines are so clever that today we've been able to replace our cameraman with one. It's reliable, cheap, and it never messes up. Uh, up. Um, hello, uh, put the plug, um, Stay cool, somebody, please. Stay cool, please. Help us its way. There's more information on the Computer Museum in the data blast at the end of the programme. But now it's time for this week's news and previews. First, a Mega Drive game that really is different and brilliant. 
Echo was a dolphin who lived a happy, carefree life until a mysterious vortex tore most of life from the sea. Echo uses sonar to talk to other sea creatures and help him solve the mystery. The graphics and the music are some of the best we've ever experienced on the Mega Drive. We'll be reviewing it when it's released in January. If you just can't decide whether to buy a computer or a console, Amstrad has solved your dilemma. This is the cunningly named Mega PC, a business computer and Mega Drive all rolled into one. To change it to a Mega Drive, you slide this panel across, plug in the joypad, like so, and then put in your cart, like that, and you can hammer away at Sonic or change your mind and go to a spreadsheet instead. Coming soon on the Mega Drive and the SNES is Another World. It's one of a new wave of games to be released on both 16-bit formats. This one takes you on an interdimensional adventure and uses cinematic zooms and close-ups to create the illusion of being in a movie. Aha, aha. Ah, shiver me Bertlers. This is a cheat for Monkey Island 2 on the Amiga. Now then, this game comes with 11 discs, but if you want to cut, 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 cutlass, sword, chop, attack, Kill! Ah. Oh, sorry, if you want to cut out the actual game playing, then try this. At the beginning of the game, press Alt and W together. You'll skip the entire game and win. And then you can give your 11 discs to your mum and dad as placemats. Now then, where's that treasure? Hmm, have a look over here, maybe. No, no, the path is next. Aha! I'm rich! Go on, go away, go away. Now, treasure, somewhere out here. This is better. Find it anywhere. Now this is my treasure, now go away! Now for some more games reviews. As Doctor Who returns to our telly screens, here's a new game for the Amiga, the ST, the C64 and the PC. Doctor Who Dalek Attack is a mid-price shoot 'em up in the arcade style. Here's Amanda to tackle the Ogrons and the Daleks. This has been very well animated and the sound's good. The graphics are a bit patchy in some places and it's very hard. For instance, these monsters take ages to die. Now I'm in London and it's full of Daleks. As everyone knows, bullets have no effect on Daleks, so I need to get some more serious weapons. At the moment I'm trying to find some serious firepower. And this is more energy, I'm just getting some more energy now. You find yourself firing more or less constantly at this game. My arm is starting to hurt by now. This game is pretty relentless. There's always something to shoot at, and this can get a bit tedious after a while. I might buy this game, but it's not on top of my list. It's very good value, but it's not the most exciting game in the world. As a fan of Doctor Who, I was really keen to see this. The main sprites are a bit disappointing, but the enemies are excellent and the sound makes it work. I don't like this game. It's much too hard, and it's difficult to keep track of the Doctor against the background. And the scores for Doctor Who? The boys gave it three out of five, and the girls gave it three out of five. Only average scores, I'm afraid. Dragon's Lair on the SNES is a platform game with a very familiar storyline. Some dippy female has got herself captured by the baddies, and as usual, our hero has to rescue her. Where would we be without men? Here's Alex to play the brave knight, Dirk the Daring. This is a hard game that you've really got to work at. I've seen this on the Amiga, but this system's a lot better. It's got great graphics and excellent sound. This game doesn't look like the original arcade version, but don't let that put you off. The sprites move really well and the whole game is smooth scrolling. There are some lovely monsters in here, and the main sprite, Dirk the Daring, has a really unusual look. Maybe it looks a bit easy, but believe me, the sword's very hard to control. One of my favourite sprites is this little fluorescent monster. You've got to hit him with your sword, and kill him, and then you can run through to the end of the level. If you find a game that will take you about 10 years to complete, then this is definitely it. It's not perfect, but it's not far off. I'd definitely buy this game. I thought this game was extremely hard, and the sword was a bit hard to control. I think it looks really good, though, and I love the main character. It's a real top-class game with great graphics. I like the way the hero moves. I'd definitely buy it. And the scores for Dragon's Lair, the boys gave it a very good 4 out of 5, and the girls also gave it 4 out of 5. Ah, Bertlers, you catch me in the middle of writing my Christmas card list to my many friends and acquaintances. Andy, no, I don't think I'll bother this year. Violet, no, she didn't send me one last year. Zed, no, can't spell his name. No, 
That's everybody. Oh well. This is a go faster cheat for exhaust heat on the SNES. Now it only works when you're already going flat out. What you do is hit the L and the R buttons together to go even flatter out. Up to 400 kilometres an hour. <laughs> right, I'm very busy. I've got to carry on with my Christmas preparations. Aha! Spikey! <laughs> Dear Spikey. Sad man. We've had a lot of letters and calls to the office recently asking is it sensible to buy computers and games from America because they're so much cheaper there. Helen Pitt of Lancaster asked, please, please, can you tell me whether or not American Mega Drives work in England? My dad says that they wouldn't because the electrical currents here are different. Is there anything you can do to change them? Well, the answer is, Helen, it's complicated, but we'll try and explain it to you. Let's take as an example the machine you were talking about, the American version of the Mega Drive, or as they call it in the States, the Genesis machine. Now, including Sonic the Hedgehog, it will cost you $120, which, at the current rate of exchange, is £78.42. In Britain, the same package costs £129.99, so at first glance, it looks like a real bargain. But, when you bring an American machine into Britain, you have to pay something called import duty and VAT, which makes the total cost £97.31, and that's the price we import it at. And you've got an American machine designed to run on American electricity, which uses different plugs. So, to use the American machine in this country, you'll need a British power plug, which costs around £15. So your total cost is now £112.31. The other problem is that the American TV system is different to ours, so the Genesis won't work with an ordinary British TV. It's possible to get the machine converted, but it's very expensive. However, some modern TVs have a special connector called a SCART. If you buy a SCART lead, another £10, you can connect them up. It should work, but you might have a black border top and bottom, and on some tellies you'll only be able to get a black and white picture. And your total cost now is £122.31, a total saving of just £7, and you've no guarantee. The American Super NES will cost you, including duty and tax, £113.53. You'll still have to buy the SCART lead, and with the SNES, you'll need professional help to rewire the mains lead. SNES carts are different in America too, look. They're bulkier, they're a slightly different shape, and they've got protection circuits built in. So, Violet, you are very welcome to that. Thank you very much. To run British SNES carts on your American machine, you'll need one of these, a converter. Another £15 or so, but then you'll need an American game to get round the protection. So, you put that in, it works like that. So, that brings the total cost of an American SNES to £158.53 pence, and that's £10 more than the British SNES. And although at the moment most Mega Drive games will run in any country, we've heard that Sega are to start also building in protection. But what about handhelds? The machines and the games are universal, but you will still have problems with the power leads and TV tuners, and the saving on handhelds are very small anyway. Of course, whatever game or machine you're thinking of buying in any country, check it out first in the Bad Influence magazine. We've also got information from today's programme in the Data Blast, and if you send us a stamped address envelope, we'll send you a printed fact sheet. Last week's competition was to win a Menace a gun attachment for the Mega Drive, plus some software, and the fabulous Bad Influence t-shirt. We asked for the name of the actor who played Indiana Jones' dad in the movie, and the answer, of course, is... Sean Connery. Thank you very much indeed. The first answer correctly identified by our random selection system came from Chris Benfield, who lives at Windy Ridge, East Grinstead, West Sussex. Well done, Chris. All that stuff's on its way to you, mate. In this week's competition, we're giving away three Atari Lynxes with Batman Returns. The question is this. The British TV transmission system is called PAL. That's P-A-L. What is the American TV transmission system called? Send your answer on a postcard or sealed an envelope to the usual address. Mark competition to arrive by no later than next Monday. And see you next week.